Hey class, and welcome to lecture 13. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 12, as we'll be in this chapter during this lecture. Roman numeral one opens up with the persecution of the church of Jerusalem by Herod. Now, verse number one says, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. This is James. So which James is this? Well, it's James, the third Christian martyr. We know that he was uh, the brother of, of John, the son of Zebedee, the uh, third Christian martyr here we know, the first apostle to die uh, for the Lord. Um, and we see the testimony here, John the Baptist, and Stephen the deacon was the, the second, and then James was the first apostle. And it's fulfillment of what Christ said in Mark chapter number, number 10. Let's walk in through the, what happened right after that. Verse number three says, because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Uh, so Roman numeral two, we see the imprisonment and release of Peter. Verse four tells us that when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quatrainions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to uh, the people. So here's what happens. He arrests uh, Peter during this time. Uh, let's take a, just a short break here on something that's usually brought up by uh, those, and that is many will have a question about what's happening during the timetable of Easter. Notice it says intending after Easter uh, to, to bring him forth to the people. Uh, Easter was a popular term, uh, a word uh, during the translation of our Bible that um, was used to describe the entire festival of Passover and unleavened bread. Uh, this would have been an eight-day event. Uh, and as you look at this closer technical textual term, uh, that we would conclude the King James Version is correct in translating Pascha as Easter in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. Many folks will say there's a mistake here, uh, but um, evidence shows that Pascha is a polyseme, which means it's a word with multiple meanings. And we know that there from the text. And many uh, commentators and many um, uh, Dictionaries will show that. So it's correct in translating that as well. Some Greek English dictionaries will show even that meaning today as translated as, as Easter. But let's go back to, as really a side note, but let's go back to what's happening with, uh, with Peter. And he was kept for execution. So after this time, he was scheduled to be executed. Verse 5 tells us that Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God uh, for him. Here in Acts chapter 12, Apostle Peter is in prison for a third time. Uh, just looking back on previous context, in chapter 4 and 5, he stood before the Sanhedrin. Each time the Lord delivered him, this time a death sentence was pronounced and uh, he was set to be publicly executed. Herod had heard how Peter was uh, previously released from prison and this time he wasn't taking any chances. He, verse 4 tells us he placed these four uh, quatrainians of soldiers. These are 16 battle-scarred servants of Rome, four sets of four, sitting six-hour shifts. Chained, he was chained on the left and on the right. One soldier would watch the inner door, the other would watch the outer door. But while the servants of Rome were at work, God's people were praying. The text tells us that prayer was made by the church. They prayed fervently, persistently, and the story tells us, the account here, Acts 12, the Lord answered their prayer. Look at Roman numeral number three, the prayer of the church at Jerusalem. Let's look at the value of this prayer meeting. Notice verse number five, while he was in prayer, prayer was made without ceasing. It was during, first of all, notice the, the reasons for prayer. It was held in a time of difficulty. It was a difficult situation. A new and serious wave of persecution was breaking out against the church, uh, scattering the the membership, it only caused the spread of the gospel. The attack was aimed at the leadership. Let me ask you, what, what puts you in your prayer closet? Do you have a time of difficulty that drives you to your knees? What causes you to abandon your schedule for others and pray for them? What changes your priority? The church was on its knees praying. It was a difficult situation. Dangers and fears tell us and show us that we need to Pray. Verse 1 says, about that time, what time? Let's look at what's happening here. It's a time of famine. We know in chapter 11, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch and told them that a famine was coming throughout the land. The citizens of Jerusalem would suffer so much so 
uh, that the offering was received from Antioch, that church that was just planted. So about that time, they're going through a famine, a bad economic trial in their life. They've got economic problems as well. And Herod, Herod is vexing the church. Who is Herod? Well, he's the grandson of Herod the Great. We know the apple didn't far too, fall too far from the tree. It was his grandfather who had ordered the children two years and younger killed because he wanted to stop Jesus. It was his father, Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist beheaded just because he didn't like his message. Now Herod Agrippa. He has James killed. Verse 2, he's vexing, searching of the church, killing the, James, the brother of John. Uh, now Jewish law was death by a sword, so he kept Jewish law and uh, he executed uh, James with the sword. So it happened, he knew that he had pleased the Jews, so he wanted to take Peter as well and do uh, the same thing. So it's a difficult situation. Think about what they're facing, facing famine, vexing the church. James has already been executed. Now Peter is in a maximum security prison and they're gonna kill him. Bad things are happening, dangerous time to live in. What did, they, what did it cause them to do to pray? What has God allowed in your life? What big things, what situations have unfolded beyond your control? It's time to pray. So they have famine, execution of the prominent leaders, imprisonment of Peter, public execution schedule. That's what's leading up to his trial. He's gonna be put on display just like the Lord had been put on display with pirates. So it's Pilate. So it's a dangerous situation. It's escalating. See, that's escalating uh, from bad to worse. Maybe what you're facing in your life isn't getting better, but it's seemingly getting worse. Pressure is mounting. Instead of it going away, it's more and more is being stacked on you. This problem is not getting better, it was getting worse, and it drove them to pray. It was difficult, it was dangerous, it was escalating, it was impossible. You see, what was impossible, humanly speaking, God could do. You see, they don't have any weapons, there's no recourse, they can't elect another king, they can't appeal to the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin won't hear them, no human options available, they can't plead their way out, protest their way out, petition their way out, no recourse. Peter is in prison being held by these guards. He's going to be executed. Nothing humanly impossible to do about it. That's when someone who's facing something difficult, dangerous, escalating, or impossible, definitely we should pray. They didn't organize a relief committee. They prayed. They knew their source of power was prayer, and they, they prayed. They sought the Lord. Notice they resolve in prayer. They were urgent. This was a priority. They made their prayer without ceasing. The phrase here, without ceasing, has the idea of its intensity. It's the word ektenese. It's a medical term. Luke is a doctor, and he uses this medical term speaking of stretching the muscle to its limit, absolute total effort, fervent stretching as far as you possibly can. That's what they're doing in prayer to God. A prayer, it's like a runner running the race, stretching towards the finish line. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. They were totally lost in prayer. The word is used of the Lord when he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane in anguish and great drops, as it were, of blood fell from him. They prayed in anguish of soul, put out a total effort in prayer, totally absorbed and lost in prayer. Continued night and day and day and night. John Bunyan made this statement about prayer. It's when thou prayest, rather let thy heart be without words than thy words without heart. God heard this prayer sometime in the middle of the night. Peter locked up and unlocked, locked down. The text tells us that the light shone in that prison cell where Peter was sleeping and an angel of the Lord came upon him and Peter was freed. He follows that angel out of that prison through the first war, through the second war, then to the iron gate that led out of the prison and into the city, the gate, the gate opened on its own, like an automatic door today. I like what Thomas Watson had to say. The angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. It was an amazing miracle of God, but something strange happens when he shows up at the door. They're praying, and knocking on the door was the answer to their prayer. But it was so outside the realm of their possibilities, they tried to rationalize, even refused to open the door. They would rather believe that it was a 
something superstitious, that it was some mistake rather than God answered their prayer. So let's notice next the roadblocks in prayer. Something remarkable happened. It shows that they really never expected God to answer their prayer. Now here's a good uh, discussion on why they didn't do this. There's several reasons for this. Number one, perhaps they prayed but didn't believe. It may have been they, they prayed for James and but he was put to death and so they didn't even try, they didn't believe. Number two, the church possibly had expected Peter to be released by Herod after the holy days and not by divine intervention. Sometimes we're guilty of imagining how God will answer our prayer. Let's let God be God. Let's not put him in a box. We're not to be advisors to the Lord. Let the Lord be God. Number three, maybe they weren't praying for his release at all, but for Peter, whom they fully expected to die. Nevertheless, God met the need. It led to, next, the rejoicing in prayer. Verse 14 tells us that when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate out of gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. She was glad. And when they finally figured out that it was Peter, they too were glad and they rejoiced. And the soldiers wondered, and, hey, when was the last time you were overjoyed by what God had, has done? And answered prayer. There are people that the word spreads across the city and they rejoiced in the things of God. Answered prayer is a blessing that, that should be passed abroad and passed around um, people who are praying. Here's Peter. Last time we see Peter, really, he's going to go off to Babylon. He's going to pastor a church there, win souls there. He's going to write first and second Peter. Well, at the end of the text, what did they do? They didn't point to themselves and they pointed back to the Lord. They rejoiced in the Lord. They worshiped him. They praised him. Lord, would you do it? And then their response was, God, you did it. And so uh, God answered their prayers. Prayer and praise is the experience, daily experience of the Christian life. Let's look at Roman number four, concerns the death of Herod Agrippa. Roman number five concerns the ministry of Saul and Barnabas in Jerusalem and returning to Antioch. So I've left you some notes on those with the death of Herod Agrippa and how he died and why he died. But um, let's look here as we, as we close. Notice uh, it speaks of Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. And when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So they had fulfilled their ministry. Some ministries are short-termed, others are lifelong. And these uh, men were faithful uh, to the end of their work. They have a new companion here. Closes with John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, the product of a Christian home where Christianity was practiced. And we'll, we'll see what happens to him later on. And uh, we're going to walk right into uh, lecture 14 now in Acts chapter 13. I'll see you in the next lecture.